I want to thank you, Brad, and everyone that worked so hard to organize this symposium. It's, as always, a pleasure to be here with uh, our community. It's been fantastic so far. Um, I think all the organizers and all the speakers up to now deserve a big hand. Particularly in the context of this moment, I, I want to thank the, the panelists that preceded me. I thought that was a very interesting, rich discussion, as they all tend to be. Um, and we're sharing a lot of good information here. I noticed that we're about an hour behind schedule. So we do have the option of we could just can this and, and go to lunch, but I don't think we're going to do that. I mean, you can if you want, but I'm kind of stuck here. Uh, so I, what I'm going to share with you today is uh, mostly a lot of it's personal reminiscence or or reflection, ayahuasca, in, in some ways I've been, I better leave that alone or I'm going to ruin it, and, and then, I don't know. <laughs> uh, ayahuasca has been a big part of my life for not quite 45 years, but almost, and uh, I've been involved with it on uh, both professionally and as a personal uh, ally and teacher, and I really honestly have to say that in some ways, in the last 50 years, the, you know, I, almost, I owe almost all the interesting things that ever happened to me to ayahuasca, directly or indirectly. It's been quite an experience to be in symbiosis or in alliance with this, with this amazing medicine. So I'm going to share some of that history with you. There's not a lot of technical stuff, a little bit of the science, but just basically tell you, you know, my story and, and uh, you know, how I got to this place um, and what, it, what it's meant for me. And of course, there'll be various uh, moments of shameless self-promotion, such as this one. Uh, this is the first one. This is my memoir, which I wrote in 2012. And there are copies in, uh, in the room where they're selling books. And uh, I'm running out of soft cover copies, so you really need to buy it. I want to clear out my storage uh, uh, unit back in Minnesota. And I, I'm trying to, so I'm aggressively uh, flogging these books. However, um, there is a, you know, if you want to know the backstory and the kind of stuff I really can't talk about here and wouldn't if I could, uh, you know, you can, you can uh, buy the book and learn sort of my, uh, the, the story of my uh, dissolute past and uh, stumbling uh, road along the road to trying to learn something from the plants. Some of you are familiar, of course, with the uh, myth, mythology, I guess you could say, the Terry and Denny story. Uh, we first went to La Chirera in the Colombian Amazon in 1971, uh, together with uh, three of our similarly uh, passionate and possibly uh, misguided friends. Um, at that time, we didn't know from uh, ayahuasca. We didn't know very much about ayahuasca. And in fact, in 1971, not very much was known. For example, the role of the admixture plants in ayahuasca was only beginning to emerge. And uh, it was only later that it was clarified that it really is an orally active form of DMT, as we all know, due to its mechanism of action. At that time, we didn't know that. We were looking for another orally active form of DMT, a very obscure Witoto uh, hallucinogen, which they called Ukuhe. And we had stumbled on this uh, reference to Ukuhe in a botanical museum leaflet by Richard Schultes called Varola as an orally active hallucinogen. And Varola, as you may know, is a, it's, there are a number of species of trees in the, in the Myristicaceae, the nutmeg family, and in various, various parts of the Amazon, the sap of varolas, many species, is very high in DMT, 5-methoxy DMT, and other tryptamines. And various tribes in the Amazon prepare snuffs from this, snap, from this sap of the varola. 
Um, and they use that, and by being snuffs, it get, gets around this whole need to inhibit MAO, as, as they were talking about earlier. But we were interested in finding an orally active form of DMT uh, because uh, we were obsessed with DMT, is what it came down to. But we were frustrated by the, by the shortness of the experience. About all you can say about DMT, it's astonishing but then it's over in 10 minutes, so then what do you say? So we were looking for something that maybe could extend that state. We could spend more time in that dimension, and that's kind of how we thought of it. And we heard about this orally active form of varola used by the Witoto at this place at the ends of the earth called La Cherera. And so we were completely obsessed with this. We were doing, we were students. My brother was at Berkeley, I was at Boulder. We gave all that up and we headed out for the Colombian Amazon in 1971 in search of Ukuhe, as they called it. And this, uh, this shows our merry band. This is actually the original Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. Uh, we called ourselves that, kind of tongue in cheek. I mean, you know, we were, we were on a hero's quest or maybe a fool's quest, who knows? But we were looking for a secret and uh, we were, we got to La Cherera, and this, we was, this is shortly after our arrival. We were resting. We had to cross a trail through the jungle from one river to another over four days. It was quite a s stressful trip. In fact, I'm amazed we survived in some ways. But we're resting, and this is uh, some of our, I don't know if this light will work. This is one of our uh, bands, a woman named Sarah Hartley. This is me, this is my brother doing what he does so well, rolling a joint. <laughs> His uh, girlfriend of just a few weeks and another anthropologist gentleman, Michael Lasky. So that was the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. And this is what we were looking for. We were looking for various varola species, uh, particularly this species. Generically, varolas are called kumalas in the Amazon, and the Watotos called this ukuhe. So we were thinking that this, we called this the secret, because we kind of thought of DMT as the secret as well. And, uh, uh, you know, so we were looking for ukuhe. This was the holy grail as far as we were concerned. When he eventually found ukuhe, it turned out not to be so, so amazing as we thought. Well, when we got to La Cherera, we found that they had cleared the pastures around this little Capuchin mission settlement, really just a, a, just a few buildings with a church and you know where the padre lived and so on. And uh, they cleared pasture around it and in those pastures they put Cebu cattle, the, the white humpbacked Cebu cattle. That happens to be, the, the dung of those cattle happens to be the preferred substrate for this this creature, Psilocybe cubensis, the mushroom teacher, the pan-tropical psilocybin mushroom. You can find this in, uh, you know, misty pastures pretty much anywhere in the world. It's, it's really a global mushroom. And uh, when we were on the way into La Cherera, we'd been told, by, warned by an anthropologist, who was uh, very unhappy to see us uh, when we showed up at the village down river where he had been working with the Watoto. And we walked into that village unannounced. There was no way you could send an email in those days or a text. So we just walked in and uh, I assure you, we were far more colorful looking than any of the Watoto. We looked like we'd stepped right out of Haight-Ashbury, which more or less we had. This was, you know, I mean, some of our people had beards down to their waist, a lot of beads and, you know, bling and that sort of thing. We were a colorful bunch, I tell you. And we showed up and this anthropologist uh, was like, where did you come from? And more importantly, why are you here? And so we said, well, you know, we're here to find Ukuhe. And that really upset him because it was like, how did you find out of this? You're not even supposed to know about this, right? Well, you know, Schultes published a paper and, and this is what we're here for. And, you know, so lead us to the Ukuhe doc. And <laughs> he wasn't too, <laughs> wasn't too ready to do that. And he, he said, well, you can't just walk into the village and start talking about this. This is like big, big shamanic magic. They're, you know, they're not going to tell you and they may kill you. 
we said, yeah, whatever. Um, you know, but actually when we went overland from that village to La Chirera, um, we it had sort of sunk in, and so we went to this village and we, we thought, you know, we'll hang around, we'll be discreet and make discreet inquiries. But then what we found were these mushrooms everywhere, pretty much huge, big, beautiful clusters growing out of every cow pipe because that was the rainy season. And we had a very cavalier attitude toward this. We thought, oh, these will be great. You know, I mean, we knew what they were. We had absolutely no experience with them, but we'd done our homework and we thought, oh, wonderful. We can play with these while we're waiting for the real secret to, uh, to show up. Well, um, the mushrooms quickly rearranged our priorities. Um, you know, we started eating them. We actually started incorporating them into our diet, which was probably not a good idea. There wasn't a whole lot to eat. And you'd be amazed what a good omelet or, you know, uh, um, mushroom soup. And they're a good additive to these things. So we uh, kind of got into this low level uh, state of being be mushroomed all the time. And it stimulated conversations. Boy, did it stimulate conversations. And, it stimulated ideas, and uh, that whole thing is chronicled in my brother's book, True Hallucinations, and, and uh, my own to a certain extent, The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. But this mushroom kind of got us off track for, in terms of what we thought we'd come for. And what we had come for some, what we'd actually come for was for the encounter with this mushroom, the mushroom teacher. And, uh, and you know, it's really, that was really a pivotal point of the rest of both of our lives. Well, I'm not gonna bore you with that. You can uh, read all about that and our, our misadventures in these various books. But 10 years later, I returned to Peru this time as a graduate student at the University of British Columbia. And I went to, uh, we went downriver from Iquitos. How many people have been to Iquitos here? Uh, a few, right. Iquitos is kind of now the epicenter of the whole ayahuasca tourism thing, or one of the epicenters. Well, when I got there in 1981, uh, it was not. It was a sleepy little river town, and nobody had ever heard of ayahuasca. There was certainly no ayahuasca tourism. There were a few anthropologists and ethnobotanists that were interested in it, pretty much opaque to everyone else. Um, so this will just geographically orient you a bit. This is La Chirera up here on the Rio Igar Paraná. This is the Rio Putumayo, which separates Peru on the south and Colombia on the north. We went down the Putumayo to um, this river, the Rio Car Paraná, up to El Encanto and then across this gap to La Chirera. Well, in 1981, we went, here is Iquitos, we went down the Amazon and up uh, to a town called Pebus, then up the Rio Ampiacu, uh, which means the river of poisons. And uh, why did we go here? I, one of the things we were looking for was, um, was uh, again, Ukuhe. Well, the, the uh, Watoto had more or less been forcibly displaced from La Chirera during the rubber boom. Mo there were only remnants of the culture there. Most of them had, been, ha had moved down to this area in the Ampiyaku, so we thought we could you know, reconnect with the Watoto culture there. And this is a few... Uh, <laughs> yeah, a few pictures. Uh, and this is a long story, but one of the people going with us was Way Davis, uh, who happened to be working with the RV Heraclitus, which was in Iquitos at the time. And so the uh, RV Heraclitus had run into a barge on its way up the Amazon, so it wasn't able to take us down there. Um, but they had another skiff, and there was a couple of other ways to get down there. So Wade. Uh, was with us and my brother also during this period of my expedition uh, had sort of invited himself along. I mean, uh, you know, and what could I say? Uh, <laughs> but uh, he wasn't really part of the university expedition, but I told him he could come as long as he uh, didn't cause trouble. Well, 
um, yeah, <laughs> that didn't work so well. But, but anyway, he came, and then we went to this place, and, uh, and we wanted to collect kumala, these various samples of these, these varola trees, and also get the indigenous people to prepare samples for them, for us. Well, um, they didn't remember how to do it. They, they were, uh, some of them sort of remembered. They were really a degraded culture. I mean, they were traumatized culture by their early 20th century uh, experiences with, uh, with, the rubber, with the rubber traders and all that. Hundreds of thousands of people in this area were enslaved, killed. A whole holocaust occurred there that nobody ever really talks about. There's a couple of books. One of them is called The Devil's Paradise. Uh, which is a description of uh, the history of that area. Pretty appalling, you know, the, these tribes were enslaved. Um, but at this time, that was all a long time ago. Well, we talked to various informants, and a lot of them just sort of, some of them said, I don't remember, my grandfather did, did it, or I, I don't even know, I don't want to talk about it. But a few of them were willing to talk about it and even try to reproduce it, even though it was you know, kind of a lost art. One of the gentlemen here uh, said he would try it, and uh, so he showed us you know, the preparation of it and eventually came up with a sample of uh, ukuhe. And uh, of course, being good, field ethnopharmacologists, uh, we had to bioassay this. That's what a lab assay is, a large animal bioassay. And uh, it just goes along with the territory. We, we, we collected about seven or so of these samples from different practitioners, and maybe uh, about three of them had some kind of activity. Uh, not really psychedelic, more, you know, not physically very comfortable, but this particular one actually turned out to be very high in 5-methoxy DMT when we finally got it back to the lab. And uh, that explains why the effects were a lot like 5-methoxy DMT. Here's my brother, after, we, after he's on his way home, he's trying to smuggle varola seeds out to uh, eventually plant in Hawaii. Um, that didn't, uh, though they didn't germinate very well. Um, okay, so, so that part of my graduate work actually, uh, you know, took place. I didn't really uh, encounter ayahuasca until later in this trip, and that was when I got into it. This is just, this is uh, beautiful examples of the plant. This is many, many years later. This is a, a specimen, I don't know if you, yeah, the vine, this is a specimen I took to uh, the land on the big island of Hawaii that eventually become botanical dimensions. Uh, I brought this specimen, I got it from Tim Plowman, who was a student of Schulte's. They had specimens at the Lion Arboretum and we planted that and that was 1976. So I guess that's really where the, the climb began in, if a cer in a certain sense. And uh, also, well, uh, you know, that was that original plant was kind of the, the diaspora of ayahuasca, if you could, if you wanted to think of it that way. The first time ayahuasca was introduced, uh, you know, outside the Amazon, and it turns out it loves Hawaii. There's lots and lots of ayahuasca being grown in Hawaii now. Um, this particular uh, specimen, being quite old, is certainly one of the mother plants. You know, it's quite large. I mean, it uh, weighs several tons. The central trunk is as big as my central trunk. It's, you know, 1,500 feet long. So these are not, uh, these, are, these are very robust plants. Some of the biggest plants uh, on earth are lianas, not trees, and ayahuasca is a liana. And then the other admixture plant, which was collected later on later expeditions, uh, we also introduced into uh, botanical dimensions on the Big Island. So that's the, uh, that's the plant, and as you know, uh, ayahuasca is made from at least two plants, uh, the vine itself, Banisteriopsis copy, uh, in the Mount Pigiaceae family, and then various admixture plants, most commonly in the Amazon, Chacruna, the middle one, Psychotria viridis. 
And north of the Putumayo, uh, often another species is used, Diploteris cabarena, or Chagroponga. Uh, that's also a vine, and it's in the same family as ayahuasca. Uh, but it, the leaves of Chagroponga contain DMT, just like Chacruna. So north of the Putumayo, uh, the custom has been to use uh, Diploteris cabarena as the, as the admixture plant. And some anthropologists say that's the distinction between ayahuasca and yahe. Yahe is made with changropanga, localized north of the Putumayo, and uh, chacruna is much more widespread through uh, the Amazon basin. And as you know, I, I don't think we have to uh, belabor this, but ayahuasca among most of the traditional psychedelics has a unique pharmacology in that the uh, Banisteriopsis, the vine, contains alkaloids that inhibit monoamine oxidase. And DMT, orally active, is broken down in the gut if there's not an MAO inhibitor. So uh, people have figured out that if you combine these, if you pr prepare them together, monoamine oxidase inhibitors in the vine will prevent the breakdown of DMT and render it orally active. So uh, that's pretty clever, you know, for primitive savages to figure this out, and they did indeed. Um, they figured out a lot of other things as well. Uh, so this is just the chemistry. The, the alkaloids in the middle are the beta-carbolines. They're indoles, like dimethyltryptamine there. Three major uh, beta-carbolines in ayahuasca, harmine, harmaline, and tetrahydroharmine. They're all... Um, Indolic alkaloids, they're all MAO inhibitors, and tetrahydroharmine also has some serotonin uh, reuptake activity as well. Well, on this same expedition, this was my main informant, uh, I guess you could say, in, in Pucallpa. Actually, I went first to Pucallpa, and I met up with Don Fidel, Don Fidel Mozambique. I had the connection because Terence and Kat, his wife at the time, had been to Pucallpa a couple of years previously, so I had a connection when I got to Pucallpa. And Don Fidel turned out to be a wonderful connection. He's the real deal. He was the real deal. He knew his plants. He was a good curandero. He did beautiful ceremonies and made beautiful medicines. And he was happy to share his knowledge with us. You can imagine how surprised he must have been when these two gringos stumbled into his courtyard, into his front yard, and said, tell us everything you know about ayahuasca in broken Spanish, and I mean really broken Spanish at that time. And uh, actually, he invited us to stick around, and he was kind enough to share his ayahuasca with us and show us how to prepare it and all that. So he got it, and he was really you know, wonderful, um, I guess, first encounter uh, with a traditional healer that, was, that turned out to be very good. Uh, he was part of a long lineage of this, uh, of this tradition called Vegetalismo. Another one of the same lineage up in Iquitos was uh, Don Emilio Andrade. And uh, he comes out of the same traditional lineage of what I sometimes called the old school of, of vegetalismo. And at the time I was doing my work in Pucallpa, my friend Dr. Luis Eduardo Luna was up in Iquitos uh, learning from Don Emilio and doing a film about him, uh, which is actually still out there. One of the first ayahuasca films, he called it uh, Don Emilio Isus Doctorcitos, Doc, Don Emilio and his little doctors. Very interesting, not high quality cinematically, but a very sweet little film just be, because it's so, so uh, you know, so amateur essentially. And it's basically Don Emilio talking about his life. You can still see it on YouTube, it's out there. Another uh, famous ayahuascaro of the same lineage, Don Jose Corral. Um, and, uh, you know, and just another one that was known and well-respected in the community. This is uh, Doc, uh, Don Jose at age 99. That was the last time um, that I encountered Don, Ho Don Jose. Um, here's another person that I've been privileged to work with, 
uh, in the Amazon for uh, ever since I got there. This is uh, Juan Ruiz. Uh, and uh, Juan Ruiz Macedo, who is not a shaman, not a curandero, he's the director of the herbarium at the uh, university, National University of the Amazon in Iquitos. And uh, when I first got to uh, Iquitos, he was a forestry student, and he was the person, poor fellow, that was designated to take these two gringos out and help them you know, find the plants they needed, but more importantly, get them back alive. <laughs> and he did that. He was a wonderful, uh, but very taciturn guide. And he took us out and it really, and he's helped many, many a graduate student in, in that way. Well, we formed a friendship and actually we still work together. He's still, now he is the director of the herbarium. And this man's knowledge, I can't say enough about it. He's got so much knowledge about these plants and it's all in here. I said, you've got to write this stuff down. You know, this is a valuable knowledge. He said, eh, why? I already know it all. <laughs> Such a great guy. I mean, he can, you can hand him a fragment of a leaf or a piece of bark. Usually he can give you the scientific name, the common name, what it's used for, and usually a funny story about some botanist that came through and collected it 20 years ago. I mean, he has an eidetic memory and tells, you know, he's just, he's just a, a prince of a guy, open-hearted, extremely knowledgeable man. And one of those resources of knowledge that Mark Plotkin refers to when he says, a when a medicine man dies, it's as though a library has burned down. This is, one is the library. And, uh, you know, uh, I hope that we can find a way to preserve what he knows. Um, anyway, so I continued on my work and I eventually, uh, um, did I, let's see, yeah. Eventually, like all good graduate students, um, I published a couple papers out of this work in the Journal of Ethnopharmacology, which was barely getting started at that time. Uh, one was on ayahuasca and one was on my work with ukuhe. The one with I about ayahuasca kind of launched my career and the one about ukuhe disappeared into the depths of, you know, the archives of biomedicine and nobody ever paid any attention to it, although it was pretty interesting as well. But, but the paper on ayahuasca did get attention and in some ways opened doors for me as a graduate, as a postdoc and, and so on. So I got this stuff, all these samples, eventually back to the lab, and I spent the next three years sorting it out, analyzing them, doing pharmacology, measuring the MAO inhibiting activity, and so on. When I got these samples, when I finished my my uh, my field work, I took a red eye from uh, Lima to Vancouver. I showed up about four in the morning and uh, I had all these duffel bags of samples and plus plant presses and all this stuff I'd collected and I looked pretty, pretty wild-eyed myself having been in the jungle for six months or so and I came to the customs agent and dumped my stuff out and I said, uh, don't worry, I have permits for all this, you know, it's all UBC, it's all kosher, and would you like to see my permits? And she looked at this, uh, this array of stuff uh, on, the, on the table and said, you know, you're the people my supervisor warned me about. <laughs> and she said, just, just get out of here. So I did. I took a cab to the, to the university and that began. So I finished uh, up my PhD in 84. And uh, then a couple years later, I was uh, invited by Eduardo Luna to uh, Bogota, to a conference uh, organized by the International Association of the Americanists. He had uh, organized a um, satellite symposium on ayahuasca, the first one, one of the first ones. So we went to the University of the Andes, uh, and our, one of the people presenting this gentleman here was uh, much younger Guillermo Arevalo. He was, uh, some of you may know of him, um, and he was, he was a young uh, ayahuascaro, Shipibo ayahuascaro, and also studying plants 
making an ethnobotanical collection and so on. So we presented there, and then after that, I went with Eduardo, who is Colombian. He grew up in Florencia, in the, in the Cacata province uh, of southern Colombia. So after the conference, he took me to visit his family uh, in Florencia, his younger brother there, and uh, guess what? They had pastures, and guess what grew in those pastures? <laughs> That's one reason they look so happy. Yeah. So I had a wonderful time meeting his family, and then we went on to Pucallpa, Eduardo and I together, because I wanted to introduce Eduardo to um, uh, Don Fidel in Pucallpa. And uh, when we got to Pucallpa, um, I had previously in 1981, I had met a gentleman who walked up to me in a, in a bar. I was enjoying a beer and he said in perfect English, can I buy you a beer? I said, sure. And as it turned out, he uh, was the local English teacher. It was Pablo Amaringo. I had no idea. And, uh, you know, we talked, and, and Pablo Amaringo was known to no one at that time. We talked, he mentioned to me that he was an amateur painter. He took me to his house and showed me some paintings of animals and trees and plants in the forest. They were certainly amateurish. Uh, and I didn't think too much about it. But when I went back to, La, to Pucallpa in 1985, I took uh, Eduardo to meet Pablo Amaringo, just because he was a friend, and uh, in the course of that conversation with Eduardo's perfect Spanish, uh, we found out that uh, Pablo had actually been a powerful ayahuascaro in his past, and that he had stepped back from it because he had gotten involved in shamanic battles with sorcerers. So he decided to give that up, and, but he said he remembered all his visions quite quite perfectly in great detail. And Eduardo asked him, and having shared that he was a paint, painter, Eduardo asked him, have you ever thought about painting these visions that you remember? And he, it had never occurred to him that he would do that. But you could see the light bulb come off over his head. And the next morning we came back and he had completed the first of four paintings which he gave to us and that eventually, that started his career. He eventually, of course, as you know, painted hundreds of paintings and became world famous for his visionary paintings, founded a whole new tradition of visionary art, indigenous to the Amazon. Together, he and Eduardo published this book, which was, came out in, I think my pointer is failing, anyway, it doesn't matter, in 1995. And uh, this book, I think, was a landmark. It was an important influence in bringing the notion of ayahuasca, something about ayahuasca, to the wider world. Because this was published by North Atlantic Press. It was distributed you know, in lots of bookstores. It became a coffee table book. And it had a collection of uh, Pablo's paintings in full color and great detail. And then on the facing page, Eduardo's explanation of what these paintings meant and what all the creatures and symbols and so on meant. So it was like a window onto the Amazonian cosmology of, of vegetalismo. And it really made it accessible to a lot of people and I think fascinated a lot of people. Uh, and that was really in some way the start of this beginning of a uh, steady stream of ayahuasca tourism. They wanted to go down and find out what was going on. And, um, and Bucalpa and Iquitos became the two magnets for the tourists. Also in this same period, Eduardo and, uh, and Pablo founded a school, the Usco Ayar School of Amazonian Painting. And it was just because Pablo wanted to teach the local kids primarily how to paint. Not visionary paintings, but realistic paintings. So he essentially opened his house, which was very modest, and uh, invited children of the village to, to come learn to paint. And many of them did. And some of them have really continued the legacy and actually have become visionary painters, such as uh, uh, Anderson Di Bernardi is one that comes to mind. He is now probably as famous as Pablo uh, and uh, has a very interesting style. So he started that. And actually, Pablo became famous for this. He got a, uh, 
he got an uh, award from the, uh, from the Rio Summit for environmental, his contribute, contribution to environmental protection through education. And I was really happy to see that. I'm very proud that I was able to introduce Eduardo to Pablo. And of course, we've all been friends for years, um, you know, some of the time anyway, most of the time. Um, so from that 85 expedition, or I wouldn't call it an expedition, but that trip, um, we, uh, one of our associates had uh, collected a bunch of plants that uh, were keeping, he was keeping in the garden and uh, was ready, was waiting for me to show up so we could take them back, which we did. And we took them in originally to San Diego, where the USDA, you know, plant quarantine station did all they could to, to kill them. You know, by the time we got them out of there, they were just sticks. But uh, Eduardo went on and took them to Hawaii. And that's where Kat and Terrence were living at that time trying to uh, establish botanical dimensions. They got these plants into the ground, and that became the core, kind of the core collection of, uh, of what's there at botanical dimensions. A lot of the dieta plants that you heard Sita talk about and, and Joe talk about, the, most of the dieta plants are there. Lots of ayahuasca, of course, lots of chacruna, and some other interesting things. And, and uh, Okay, so that was all 85. Fast forward to 1981, 1991. In 1991, we were, I was invited along with some other scientists that were working in, in the area of ayahuasca, anthropology or botany or whatever. We were invited by uh, the Uniao de Vegetal, the Brazilian um, church that uses ayahuasca. They call it wasca. That's the Portuguese transliteration of it. They invited us to a conference and we all came down and gave our PowerPoints and spent an interesting uh, few days uh, hanging out with the UDV. And, and uh, it turns out they had a sort of a secret, I wouldn't call it secret, but an agenda that was unofficial. And the uh, agenda that was unofficial was they wanted to do a biomedical study of ayahuasca. Uh, they were concerned, uh, the Brazilian regulatory agencies was concerned that ayahuasca was a terrible drug. These were all drug abuse, they were having orgies, you know, it was, I mean, they were concerned. This, this has to be bad, right? Uh, the UDV wanted to get outside investigators to do a study on ayahuasca as though that would give it more credibility. So that was their agenda in 1991. And uh, turns out a lot of us had been thinking about the same thing. So I went back to the States and I was able to cobble some money together from some generous donors who put up some funds. One of the, one of the uh, most significant uh, contributors had the last name of Rockefeller uh, and another one of the Donors had the last name of Barnhart, and I think maybe Barnhart is here in the audience someplace. So thank you, Robert. Uh, anyway, we got about 75 grand, which is not a whole lot, but we were able to come back there in 1993 and carry out this study. And we had Brazilian scientists. Dr. Charles Grobe was the uh, principal investigator uh, at that point. Um, and we had scientists from Brazil and Finland, and uh, we carried out the study, and we did it at the uh, Nucleo Calpari, the temple of the UDV in Manaus, Brazil, which was the original temple, and uh, again, I don't know, up there in the corner, and in order to carry out the study, we had to do what they call a preparo. We had to prepare the medicine. Well, the UDV has a big constituency. They have to make enough ayahuasca uh, every two weeks or so to serve 10 to 20,000 people. So these people do it on an industrial scale, and this is just shows some of the stages in the preparo. Interesting event to attend. It takes about 48 hours, and it is a ceremony as much as it is an industrial production process. Uh, the ayahuasca has to be tested at every stage along the way, blessings made, all of that. So we did the preparo. 
and then this is a, just stages. It's inter this is the ayahuasca when it's just about ready, and you notice that rainbow sheen on the surface. That's actually the beta carbolines. The beta carbolines are fluorescent, and so one sign they look for is when the sun hits it. If you can see the beta carboline sheen, then that's a sign that your uh, your brew is cooked. Um, and so we didn't have a hospital or anything to do this study. We, um, this is really irritating, you know that? All right, I don't know. Um, we, just, uh, we just set up shop in, in the temple and uh, we had 15 volunteers and they came every day and we would hook them up to catheters and we would collect blood samples and platelet samples so we could do pharmacokinetics. And, uh, and then did different psychological screenings, uh, you know, the obvious ones, heart rate, blood pressure, and pupillary, pupillary diameter. We took some plasma samples to look at uh, uh, receptor binding profiles. Uh, and we administered uh, what you might call psychiatric life story interviews. We had a Portuguese uh, psychiatrist uh, who was uh, who would uh, do the translation along with Dr. Grobe, and we would transcribe these interviews, which were basically, how did you get into the UDV? What brought you to ayahuasca? So this is uh, this is in the lower there. That's Dr. Grobe, Jace Calloway, and myself. I think my role at this point was demoted to something like chief uh, test tube labeler or something. But I, I did anyway. Uh, so our key findings from this study were interesting. That we found no evidence of acute toxicity. We found no evidence of any neurological, cognitive, or personality dysfunctions in long-term users. In fact, the long-term the long users on these parameters, which we determined by different questionnaires and you know instruments, right? Um, the UDV drinkers were slightly significantly, only slightly, but significantly more better performers than the, con the comparable controls. In other words, their brains function better, uh, is one way to sum it up. Most interestingly, from these uh, life story interviews, we found that most members had come to the UDV because they were in a crisis, often involving alcohol, sometimes drugs, sometimes domestic violence, sometimes the whole mix. And they had usually come to the UDV because a friend had urged them to do so. Most of them reported that their initial experiences were terrifying. And they saw essentially their path and they saw where they were going off track and what might potentially happen to them if they didn't change their lives. They often had a kind of a beatific vision in a certain way of Mr. Gabriel, who was the founder of the religion. So he was kind of their, their prophet figure. Uh, one fellow said, I, I saw myself in a canoe, and I was in a canoe, and it was going down the river. There were rapids. It was a very narrow canoe, and I was afraid I was going to, it was going to capsize, but then I looked at the canoe ahead of me, and Mr. Gabriel was standing in the bow of the canoe, and then I knew it was going to be all right. So, like that, and they had these redemptive life-changing experiences and uh, that they all insisted that the, that you know being in the UDV was just as important as the medicine for this having this supportive context for their experiences well so that was interesting one of the naive questions that we'd asked at the time was is there any biochemical marker is there anything that makes long-term drinkers of ayahuasca different from people that don't drink ayahuasca. We had no idea what we were looking for, but guess what? When we did um, receptor binding profiles on platelets, which we had connected, which we had collected, platelets are often a peripheral marker for what's going on in the, perifer in the central nervous system, we actually found a significant difference in the abundance or the density of serotonin transporters. Not serotonin, but serotonin transporters. We saw a significant upregulation in serotonin transporters in the long-term drinks of ayahuasca compared to controls. And we thought, well, what does that mean? 
you know? I mean, so there is a difference. So what does it mean? Well, we didn't really know. But we did what you do when you're in that. We went into the literature and we found out that there was a literature related to various behavioral abnormalities related to deficits in the serotonin transporters, either suppressed expression of the transporter uh, genes controlling expression or from other causes. And we found that uh, uh, you know, pathologies were related to this transporter deficit. Certain kinds of alcoholism, alcoholism associated with violent or homicidal behavior, suicidal behaviors, binge eating, and other disorders. So you thought, well, that's interesting. Here you have a long-term modulation uh, upregulation of the serotonin transporters and you have the behavioral change that it's made in people's lives. It's almost too neat, um, but there it is. So it suggested that maybe the ayahuasca could actually reverse these deficits, actually raise the, uh, you know, the expression of the, of the serotonin transporters and, and that, that might be uh, therapeutic, it appeared to be. So this is really as far as this has gone, but it, it, it should be investigated more. Ayahuasca is the only pharmacology that I know of, unless there's been other, other discoveries, that does this, that, that upregulates the serotonin transporters. So, okay. So, yeah, I think. So uh, this, is, uh, this is just... Uh, so we published uh, over the next uh, eight years after this was uh, after this uh, study was concluded, we published about eight uh, peer-reviewed journals or peer-reviewed articles about the results of our study, and it was kind of an inflection point in the interest in ayahuasca research. In 1990, here's the number of publications about ayahuasca-related topics in PubMed. PubMed being the big you know, the central biomedical database that everybody goes to. So 80, 85, 86, 90, not so much, but here was when we did the study, and then there's almost an exponential rise. If you go to PubMed now and you put in ayahuasca as a key word, you'll find uh, uh, close to 160 peer-reviewed uh, papers on ayahuasca. So it stimulated interest, and, uh, and the work goes on. Okay, I, let's see. Oh, I, guess I'm, I guess I'm not too far. Um, and discoveries go on. I mean, we thought we pretty well had the, uh, the chemistry and pharmacology of ayahuasca figured out, you know, but it turns out that harmine, for example, which is what I sometimes call the hoary old alkaloid, it was discovered even before ayahuasca was discovered in Paganum harmala. We kind of thought, uh, uh, you know, harmine was the MAO inhibitor that uh, prevented the breakdown of DMT. Well, it is that, but recent research shows that it does a lot more. It does other things. It interacts with a number of receptors, and it's involved in things like neurogenesis, uh, stimulation of nerve growth. Uh, it inhibits this interesting uh, regulatory protein called DYRK. 1A that has to do with stimulating nerve growth in, uh, in the hippocampus and also cognitive deficits and a number of other things. And harmine is a very potent inhibitor uh, of that. So harmine, the other beta carbolines, tetrahydroharmine is another one that's worthy of more investigation. So the beta carbolines are anything but they're much more than just MAO inhibitors. And they have, you know, other types of uh, activity like antiviral activity and anti-tumor activity and, and lots of things. So there's still a lot to sort out in the chemistry of ayahuasca, even though it's been studied for really decades uh, since the early part of the 20th century. Okay, so... Um, I want to skip ahead for a minute. Uh, um, in, uh, in 2004, I received a grant, most unlikely grant probably ever awarded, <laughs> from uh, an institution called the Stanley Medical Research Institute. And uh, 
they, I had attended a conference sponsored by NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, and the name of the conference was interesting. It was Potential uh, Therapeutic Applications of Illicit Plants, right? Illicit Plants. I went to this conference, I gave my usual shtick about ayahuasca, and went home. A couple of weeks later, a guy from the Stanley Medical Research contacted me and said, you know, we support schizophrenia research and we're interested in uh, natural products. We have some uh, people working in China looking at Chinese medicines, but we don't have anyone looking at South American medicines. Potentially, would you be interested? He said, well, well, yeah, we gave away $160 million last year. I said, where do I sign, right? <laughs> did not get $160 million, sadly, uh, but I did get about half a million dollars, and that kept me going for the next four years, going to South America and collecting these plants and, uh, you know, reporting the result. This is Alan Shoemaker. Some of you may know him. He's an long-time Iquitos expat, and he and his wife, Mariella, helped us a lot with logistics. And here's my uh, part of my collection crew, uh, pretty motley crew, Juan, Juan Ruiz, there on the right. A uh, couple more, uh, this gentleman on the left, uh, Carlos Pabon, um, looks like he escaped from an LA gang, but he's actually a brilliant PhD molecular biologist, and uh, our guide for part of this Aku uh, went by the name of Aku, Richard Fowler. And Richard Fowler is another Iquitos character. I mean, this guy's colorful. I don't know how good a guy did it he is, but he was sure fun to have along, you know. He was uh, ex-CIA, ex-special ops, ex-everything, and, you know, a real jungle rat in a certain way. And, and so he was part of our expedition. And then there's Aku again. Here we are. Uh, we went back to Pukorkio in, uh, up the Ampiyaku, where I had been there 25 years before. And uh, so this is a, uh, a Bora uh, headman, village headman. And uh, Aku, and somewhere along the line, um, a person, uh, a young woman named Sarah Hutt, an independent filmmaker, encountered us in Iquitos, and she wanted to make a, uh, uh, a film about traditional medicine, not necessarily about ayahuasca, but traditional medicine. So we invited her to, to uh, you know, tag along and, and do a film, and this was her, and we caught her just in time. She was going native, uh, but we were managed to you know, pull her back from that. Anyway, she eventually uh, came up with a little film which was uh, very nice. Well, I should say this. Eventually, um, they got a paper out of this work. This is, this is what their half a million dollars resulted in, ultimately. Uh, we used receptor binding, receptor screening techniques. So I think it says receptor screening technologies in the evaluation of Amazonian ethnomedicines medicines with potential application to cognitive deficits, okay? And uh, Sarah managed to do it much more entertainingly. She made a little documentary, only about 10 minutes, called The Shaman and the Scientist. And uh, lately we've reconnected and we've been kind of given this thing around and, and uh, you know, in different places. And, uh, um, and in February, she contacted me and she said, I, I want to submit it to the Philip K. Dick Film Festival. The Philip K. Dick Film Festival? I mean, that, isn't that avant-garde science fiction and stuff? And she said, yeah, but you know, my friend organizes it and he wants, to, he wants you to come and he wants to, to show it at this festival. So we did. We had a panel discussion afterwards and good for Sarah, she actually got an award for uh, best, uh, best short documentary. And uh, I think we have enough time to show this. I want to... Uh, I want to show the clip. Can I do that? Can I just do it from here? This is only a minute and a half or so. Uh, there is no internet connection. How can that be? Okay. I thought 
thought I had the internet connection. We have a backup here, <laughs> I think. Okay, and let's see if that works. Uh, yeah. Or working Oh, you got it. Okay. How about the sound? There you go. Ain't technology wonderful when it works? Sacarle a esto es cortarle, ¿no? Y uno se agrega acá un envase, se lo prende acá, entonces se va juntándose la leche. Es una medicina para purgante, ¿no? Y también para parásitos, todo tipo de enfermedad, ¿no? Es un grandes doctores de, de la ciencia vegetal, espiritualmente, son, tienen espíritu, son vivos. a much better chemist than chemists are. Plants have been synthesizing compounds for, you know, 250 million years or longer. They've created a tremendous unexplored repository of molecular structures that are far beyond anything any chemist could ever dream up. Okay, well, that's very short. I thought it was actually longer than that, but um, you can go to the shamanandthescientist.com and I think the whole thing is, is, can be viewed now. So, so that was good. I mean, that was a way to kind of, you know, in a, in a way that's accessible to most people, bring attention to the fact that the Amazon and these other biodiverse regions are tremendous repositories of what are essentially undiscovered medicines. And this is one reason that, among many reasons, why we should try to preserve these environments. You know, and that species and the knowledge are both rapidly disappearing. So that is one of the crises that we face. So, okay, so uh, that's a reflection. And then this, this is the other, this is what's been consuming my life for the last, year, um, the Ethnopharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs was originally a, a conference that was held in San Francisco in 1967, sponsored by the National Institute of Mental Health, of all, pe all things. You know, the U.S. government paid for this. 1967, the focus was not on this. It was on what was going on in Haight-Ashbury, right? This conference was a closed conference, very quiet, discreet at the University of California at San Francisco. But all the leading lights of the day were there. Shulgin, Schultes, other ethnobotanists, Claudio Naranjo, various people, and, and they had this symposium. And the only thing the taxpayer ever got out of it was a book, the symposium proceedings. And uh, that book, fell into my hands and at age 17, somehow, I don't know how it happened, but it was a real inspiration for me because I could see that there was actually a field of science related to this work. And I thought, well, maybe I can be an ethnopharmacologist. And, you know, and in my 17-year-old teenage brain, there was the, yeah, man, you can get paid to get stoned, right? Well... <laughs> It took a long time to do that. It was a little, a little more nuanced than that, but there was that idea of being able to, uh, oops, sorry, sorry. It's not supposed, it's, it's all right already. It's not supposed to, almost done, almost done. Um, 
But then that, that book was an inspiration to me at the time, and, and it was kind of a snapshot of the state of ethnopharmacology, such as it was at that time. Well, I've wanted to do a commemorative symposium ever since. The government was supposed to do this every 10 years or so, uh, but they stepped back from it. The war on drugs came along. They became embarrassed that they had anything to do with this, so the the work languished and was noted by very few. Well, in 2017, it all came together and we were able to, with the help of a lot of other people, I was able to organize a symposium in the UK at a place called Tyringham Hall and we did the 50th anniversary uh, symposium. And then from that, uh, we published, we republished the 67 proceedings and the 2017 proceedings. And so, you know, we gave back. In 1967, live streaming was, no one would have known what you were talking about if you talked about live streaming. But in 2017, we were able to live stream all the lectures uh, as well, and so those those things are in a vid Vimeo archive, and uh, you can look at them. Uh, and you can also, unless they're already sold, buy the book. Another shameless promotional slide here, but the book is in the in the book room, and this is this is the result uh, of this work. Um, so that's what I've been doing. That's how I've been spending my time for the last year, and I think this book is gonna be a bit of a landmark, uh, or at least a marker, I don't know if a landmark, but a marker of the state of the art of ethnopharmacology now, and there's still a lot to be done. You would think that uh, people have been scouring the, the biomes of the world for new psychoactive plants, and that's true, a few, but there's still a lot unknown and a lot that's really not reported. So if you want to go into ethnopharmacology uh, and if and you don't mind being professionally marginalized and working for very low pay for the rest of your life, go for it. It's, <laughs> you know, it's really a fascinating field and there's a lot, a lot that we still haven't discovered in, in the world's in biomes and even notion, uh, even oceans. I've been very fascinated late, lately by some of the reports of on, on uh, psychedelic fish, which uh, I don't think anybody's uh, figured out what that is, except that they do exist. Nobody has any idea what the active ingredients are. Um, all right, thank you very much. How do you find trusted sources of ayahuasca and ingredients? Well, I don't try to find it here as a rule. Um, I, I go to South America and uh, I've been doing this long enough. I just work through networks of people I know. and It's kind of tricky. You, you kind of have to work for, through trusted networks and find good uh, at least as good uh, ayahuasca heroes who know their plants and then know how to use it. Um, so I, I've been lucky. Um, um, but it, it's possible with a little research and the right kind of networking to, to find it, you know. Um, so, anybody else? Any other questions? Okay. In the Brazilian Amazonia, a lot of the Pajés uh, and the elders uh, have passed on with the westernization of the jungle. A lot of the knowledge of the sacred plants is being lost. And I want to know, I mean, there's a few uh, forces like indigenous celebration that are trying to protect that. Do you know of any other powerful you know, resources or ways that we can make the population aware that the ecology of the planet is most important and the destruction of the rainforest and the destruction of the sacred plant uh, medicines, which is where all pharmacology comes from, um, how uh, a network would be established or do you have one that we can 
uh, bank on that could get this information out and put protection of Mother Earth. Right, well, yeah, I mean, there's certainly a need to make people aware of this. I, and uh, there are many um, institutions or uh, NGOs and so on that are trying to preserve the rainforest. Um, and preserve the ayahuasca species in particular. Uh, the one organization that I would really highly recommend you all check out, you know, their ethics are impeccable and their effectiveness is also, they're very effective, but that's ISERS. That's the uh, International Center for Ethnobotanical Education Research and Service. So it's ISERS.org. And they, both of those have kind of adapted, adopted, I guess you could say, ayahuasca and also iboga, to a certain extent peyote. And their primary mission is the preservation of these species, of the preservation of the knowledge, the development of sustainable sources, and they also actually have created uh, legal uh, resources. They've created something called the Ayahuasca Legal Defense Fund which uh, defends practitioners who, for one reason or another, they come to foreign, from foreign countries to do ceremonies and they get, uh, you know, they get arrested or they get in trouble with the law. They have a group of legal ex experts that can help those folks. And ICERS is uh, you know, a non-profit. Uh, they're very effective, but they, I urge people to support it if you can. They're doing very effective work. That would be the first place I'd go. So, thank you. Thank you very much, guys.